I have something on my mind tonight. That's better than the alternative. <laughs> but it's born out of our study of the Gospel of Mark as we have been week by week by week reading episodes in the ministry of Jesus. We have together heard from the writer, from the author of the Gospel of Mark, one episode following the next, which created amazement in the crowds and which invite us to be filled with that power that Jesus exhibited, and then to follow in his company. Seems to me from our study in Mark that the focus of a Christ-like life is outward. Just think about the example he gave us. He said about himself, he called himself the Son of Man, he said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. No home, no house, no property. He said, uh, after he had done the most amazing things, healing, feeding, he said, uh, tell no one. Keep it to yourselves, at least for now. He said, I have been sent by my Father. It's my Father's will that I do. He said to the one who claimed that Jesus could save himself from the cross, he said nothing, no answer. He referred to himself in the images of the suffering servant. He washed the feet of his disciples, and then he died on the cross. The example that Jesus set of what we might live if we desire to live a Christ-like life is not to draw attention to ourselves, not to deal primarily with our own needs, but to live an outward life, a life of service, and share it. Before he died on that cross, he had predicted it. According to the Gospel writer in Mark, he predicted it three times. Chapter 8, 32, 9, 32, chapter 10, 33. Three times he predicted what was ahead. The first time he predicted it, and we talked about it a week or two ago, Peter said, no, 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 no. I have a better idea. The second time he predicted it is in the, read, the text we read tonight. And then we learned that the result was they spent their time arguing about which of them was the greatest. The third time he predicted his death, which will come in the 10th chapter, we discovered that two of the disciples took him aside and privately, secretly, suggested to him that he might find a special way to honor them when he came into his kingdom. Jesus lived a life of self-sacrifice. He walked his way to that cross, and his disciples found it very hard to understand or to get ready. Clearly, they are not ready yet as we come to this chapter in the Gospel of Mark. Now, it's easy to ridicule the disciples, and I don't want to ridicule them, but I want to say that I'm embarrassed for them and by them. They're fortunate that there was no YouTube at the time, or they would have continued to be embarrassed generation after generation and seen themselves on television. They were not ready. They were not ready yet. They needed more time. They needed more training. They needed more experience. Maybe they needed more suffering. Before they could care for others, they needed to learn something they had not yet learned. Peter, Perhaps he needed the humiliation of the denial, denying his Lord three times. 
and then his rehabilitation. James and John, the two disciples who will come up in the next chapter, chapter 10, they had to go through the hell of Holy Week and witness the terror of the death of their Lord and Master before they were ready. And Thomas, Thomas needed the humiliation of the embarrassing moment of being forced to express his doubt before his colleagues and then humbly before his Lord. Maybe then they would be ready. Ready to live the life as Jesus showed them. Jesus, the exemplar of a life of faith, a life of service, a life of selflessness. The focus of the Christ-like life, I said, is outward. And if it's true for individual Christians like each one of us, perhaps it's also true of churches. Maybe churches also need time and experience to be ready. And maybe churches also need some suffering. One church I served as an interim pastor elsewhere, but in Minnesota, burned down twice in its hundred year history. And each time they cleared the ground, scraped it clean, and rebuilt. They were convinced that the experience it would, experiences would make them stronger and that their mission was clear to be in that place and to continue to proclaim the gospel as they had so long before. I was raised in uh, New York, in Brooklyn, and Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, is a neighborhood of immigrants. <coughs> But it kept changing, that is, near the waterfront, near the docks, it kept receiving new immigrants from other parts of the world. So when I was a kid, it was all Scandinavian. We had Norwegian churches and Swedish churches and Danish churches. They finally were tolerant enough to allow English language services also. But all of that began to disappear. And the new neighbors moved in, did not understand the ethnic issues, did not understand the language, did not understand the peculiarities, I can say that because I'm one of them, of Norwegian and Swedish and Danish Lutherans. And now, after the challenge, after the change, after the struggle, now the, those neighborhoods are filled with Chinese Christian churches. They're filled with Spanish language Lutheran churches. They're filled with people from Palestinian Christian churches. The ministry, the mission continues to go on. Everything has changed. But the self-sacrifice, the giving, the reaching out made it possible for that transition to take place. Well, how about closer to your home? How about Calvary? Are we in training here? Are we in the process of God's Spirit shaping us for some new future, some new thing? Are we being turned in that outward direction? There have been some delays in them our history. There have been some detours that took us by surprise. And there's always tension between what we wish we could do for ourselves and what we know we have to do for others. That's the challenge of benevolence giving in any church. We're invited to give and we have the long list of needs for the life of our congregation and our building in our ministry, but we always are reminded that outward reach, 
makes it necessary for us also to give to those benevolent causes, those mission opportunities that reflect that true call to be Christ-like and to reach outward. Food, which is a common part of our life together, we have wonderful food here, but we remind each other from time to time as we have good food that there are people who are in hunger. And we've reminded ourselves this fall of ways in which we could be of assistance, including to young people at the high school food show. We uh, love, I just heard one, we love our children and our babies. And uh, we remember there are some families that are not able to provide diapers. And when you came in today, did you see that crib is just about full? In fact, we have a letter from the people who are helping us with the distribution of those diapers. And I just read this, so I thought I'd share it. It says, we are so flattered and thrilled that you would choose to partner with us. The babies of Douglas County thank you too. How amazing that you already have a crib full of diapers for us. There is such great need, all capital letters. And we are so grateful for Calvary's outreach ministry. We are being shaped. We are being trained. We are being led by God's Spirit. We are helping each other understand that a Christ-like congregation is directed outward. We have ministry for each other. We have ministry to seniors in our congregation, but it's not just a matter of how do we entertain our seniors, it's a matter of enlisting the, the power and the resources and the wisdom of hundreds of seniors who are part of Calvary to help us to be God's people in this community. We have youth ministry, which is not only directed to the benefit of our youth, but to find opportunities for our youth to be involved also in service. The Christ-like congregation, like the Christ-like life of individuals, is directed outward. It is to the world that God has sent us. It is for the benefit of the world that we have been enlisted in this cause. So the questions we ask are questions like this. What can I do? How can I help? What has God given to me that should be shared? Because I believe so deeply and so strong that God gave me grace and faith for the sake of that world.